thank you for coming uh, to this uh, event on Indian democracy. Uh, you don't know it yet, perhaps, but you will know it very soon that we have an extraordinary scholar in our midst uh, this evening. He doesn't yet have a high profile uh, in Bangalore, certainly uh, yet, but uh, you will discover that he should have a very high profile given uh, the insights and the uh, sharpness of his thinking that you will get to hear very, very soon. It is my pleasure to uh, welcome Steve Wilkinson, who is the Nilekani Professor of Indian and South Asian Studies and Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at Yale. He's also the Henry Luce Director of Whitney and Betty McMillan Center for International and Area Studies. Professor Wilkinson, among other things, you can read the long bio, but in 2015 wrote a seminal book called The Army and Nation, uh, published by Harvard, which used archival data from India and the UK as well as post-independent sources, in particular to examine India's success in managing the imbalanced colonial army it inherited in 1947. Of course, that might have lessons for lots of imbalance that we inherit in many areas, so you will uh, perhaps be able to extend that uh, learning uh, from Professor Wilkinson to other areas as well. He's currently working on a book with Somitra Jha on, on war and political change. So Professor Wilkinson is a scholar uh, on Indian democracy, but he comes at it from the angle of uh, war, conflict, uh, political change, democracy. So that's, uh, it should be very, very, very interesting to hear. After Professor Wilkinson speaks for about 25 minutes, uh, we will have him in conversation with our very own Dr. Sandeep Shastri, who is, as all of you know, uh, uh, a TV personality and very much uh, uh, from Bangalore. Uh, Professor Shastri, Dr. Shastri is pro-vice chancellor of Jain. I'm not allowed to say Jain University anymore. That's one of those quirky things that the Department of Education has now invented that you cannot say university after. So I have to say it the following way, which is pro-vice chancellor of Jain, a deemed to be university, and heads its center for research in social sciences and education. Uh, as you know, Professor Shastri is uh, prolific in his writings and his speaking on television, and so it should make for a very interesting conversation between the two. After, after that, uh, there will be plenty of time uh, for Q&A. So with that, uh, please give a warm hand to Professor Wilkinson. A talk a few days ago um, in an IIMB uh, series uh, on uh, the military side of uh, India's democratic success. Um, uh, given, as, as they said in the introduction, that I'd written this book on essentially how India managed the problem of its military after independence and why it did so much better than Pakistan. But uh, what I'd like to talk about today is the other side of the equation, the political party uh, aspect of India's success. Why was it that uh, India became democratic when so many other countries uh, did not? And how important were uh, the political party and the electoral uh, part of that success? So let's see if I can do this. So India's democratic consolidation after 1947 is in sharp contrast to uh, many, uh, let's say most, uh, other former colonies. So here on the left, we have a picture of uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the president of uh, Ghana, uh, formerly the Gold Coast, which became the first African colony to get independence in 1957. And then uh, this is a picture of uh, President Nkrumah and his military officers, who displaced him in 1966. And then on the right, of course, we have uh, Ayub Khan, um, the uh, dictator of, uh, the general who became the dictator of uh, Pakistan in 1958 and set off um, a period of either formal or informal uh, military rule that we've seen uh, ever since. So three long periods of direct military rule and then a lot of military influence the rest of the time. So the obvious question is, why did India do so differently uh, from uh, many other former colonies in Africa and Asia? 
And then, uh, in particular, why did it do so uh, differently from Pakistan, given that they shared many of the same institutions uh, prior to 1947? So that's basically where I'd like to uh, take you in the next 20 or 25 minutes or so, and um, talk about the importance of uh, parties. And in particular, the pre-1947 uh, period of party development in uh, India. So obviously the colonial elections were not uh, free and fair in the way that we know elections today, but I want to try and make a case that they were very important in explaining uh, why India has done well after independence and also in explaining why India has done better than uh, Pakistan. So the argument I'm gonna make is that the broad-based party development that we had in the period prior to 1947 and the multiple elections that we had at the provincial uh, and local levels in India and the experience in government that Indian politicians gained during this period really helped India get over the hump of independence and then helped uh, the state take a lot of early and decisive actions to solve important issues in these different areas after independence. Civil military relations, the language, uh, regional and caste conflicts, and major things like land reform, which uh, were massive obstacles to, to democracy in many uh, other regions. So first, um, why, why would we think that party development in the pre-1947 period, in the pre-independence period, would be important? So we'll have a little political science course. So there's, there's two things I want to, to sort of communicate. First, political scientists um, think that you can't have a strong democracy unless you have strong political parties. And in particular, they've come up with this concept of uh, party system uh, institutionalization to try and describe what they mean by what parties do for a democracy. So there's this list of these four conditions here that Mannering and Scully and other political scientists have talked about. So stability and inter-party competition, the existence of parties that have stable roots in society, broad agreement on the rules of the game, and party organizations themselves that have reasonably uh, stable rules and structures. So that's one important aspect of why parties matter. The other thing that makes it important, if you think of the, um, you know, the Arab Spring recently, where you had all these democratic um, movements against authoritarian governments, the authoritarian government collapses, you then have elections, uh, why don't those lead to stable governments? Well, one big reason they don't lead to stable governments is all of a sudden people get to vote, but the political party leaders themselves haven't yet worked out the rules of the game, don't trust other people, um, and you end up with lots of conflict in an environment of severe mistrust where nobody agrees on the rules of the game and they haven't had a chance to work out uh, whether the people they're dealing with are um, people they can do deals with or not. And you end up with uh, one election one time sometimes in these kind of states because people aren't used to the idea of alternation in government, they don't trust the other elites, uh, and you get lots of conflict that can't be absorbed by the party structures. Um, that's a real problem. Um, most colonies uh, in the various colonial empires had some experience with elected governments at the time of independence. So what I, what I and a co-author, uh, Max Honorato, have done is gather data on 140 different uh, colonies and their experience of democratic government prior to, uh, oh, sorry, their experience of elections prior to the point of independence. So this shows you all these 140 uh, different colonies. And you know, as we can see, only um, a minority, 10%, had no elections of any kind prior to decolonization. So having elections prior to uh, decolonization is the norm. It's not an exception. Uh, however, that experience really varies a lot across different uh, empires. So in the British colonies, on average, you had much longer periods of total electoral experience compared to, say, the French colonies, uh, or the Belgian colonies, or the Portuguese colonies. And in British colonies, a lot more of that experience was likely to be due to um, uh, local assemblies that actually had tax-raising powers and ran uh, significant parts of the state, whether it be education, agricultural policy, or at the very end of the uh, colonial period, uh, law and order, than through um, elections to metropolitan assemblies. If you were in a French colony, 
you elected people to sit in Paris rather than to run your local affairs uh, back in the particular colony that you were, which is a very different kind of democratic experience than people get in uh, the government of the United Provinces or the government of Madras in India prior to independence after the 1935 Government of India Act, where there is some uh, not complete autonomy by any means, but uh, there is some genuine control over important areas of local um, of, uh, local taxation, agricultural policy, law and order. So India had a lot more experience with these kind of elections than most other states. What I've done here is put all 140 colonies, and, as w and the number of years um, before independence at the time of their first election. So you can see there's this real clustering over towards the left of the graph here. Most states only got a year, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years of experience with any kinds of elections. And India has a pretty substantial period of uh, exposure to elections. The first municipal elections come in in India in the 1870s. And then we get uh, an expansion to the provincial level at 1909. Uh, then uh, we go after the First World War, the 1919 reforms, and then the Government of India Act in 1935. So there's quite a long period of experience with elections and with party development prior to the point of independence. And this just shows you the average years of elections at independence. In India, um, you've had uh, 75 years of any election since the first uh, municipal elections come in in the 1870s before independence in 1947. And if you're thinking about the provincial level or the state level, uh, now it's 38 years since those first uh, provincial councils got established in uh, 1909. But as you can see, that's a lot more than the average of the 20 other countries in Asia where you got 35 years of any elections on average, and um, you know most countries get a lot less than that. These averages are thrown off. And in Africa as well, 24 years of any elections and only 15 years of elections to local assemblies. So most countries that become colonies have a lot less, ex uh, most countries that are colonies have a lot less experience with uh, elections uh, than India. That's true in Asia, it's true in Africa, it's also true in other regions. So why would we think that this might actually reduce the levels of conflict that you have after independence and make uh, democratic transitions uh, easier and building a state after independence easier? I think there's three reasons. Uh, firstly, if you actually look at the, um, at the uh, debates in these legislative assemblies in Bihar or in Madras or uh, other regions prior to the point of independence, there are endless uh, complaints and moves by members of these assemblies to uh, devolve more power to Indians themselves. We want, uh, we want more uh, education, we want more Indians in top uh, jobs, we want an end to racist uh, restrictions uh, that guarantee certain positions to Europeans, we want more control basically, um, and this, has a direct effect on uh, human capital formation, you might think. So because the um, Indians are pushing through these legislative uh, assemblies for a devolution of uh, more power and opening up of uh, more jobs, more educational system positions to Indians, Indians at the point of independence are controlling far more of the colonial state than uh, other colonial states. So if you think of the Belgian Congo, it's probably the worst example of all the European uh, colonial uh, empires. Uh, the year before independence of the top 6,000 civil servants in uh, the Belgian Congo, not one is Congolese. There are no Congolese officers at all in the Belgian Congo uh, army. There are 14 university uh, graduates in a country of 40 million who are Congolese, and there are tiny numbers of people in high school. Compare that to India, where there are tens of thousands of university graduates being produced each year, where the vast bulk of the state is being run by Indians, and even the ICS is 50% um, Indian just before independence. It's really only in the army that uh, the British keep control right up until the end. And even in the army, during World War II, they recruit 14,000 new Indian officers as they expand the army to fight the war. So it's a very different kind of experience. 
The second reason I think that uh, adding uh, these, uh, th that having these elections makes a difference is that it lessens the gap between um, the new state's laws and formal institutions and popular uh, aspirations in the country as a whole. So in the Congo example I just gave, all the rules had been made by Europeans. There was no local investment in these rules whatsoever. But it's a very different situation in India where Indians themselves are working some of the laws, or creating in some cases some of the laws, and obviously the tension between the institutions and the laws are going to be less. And the best example of that is that 1935 Government of India Act, many of the clauses are taken quite wholesale into the Indian Constitution in 1950. Of course, many are dropped, but the Indians are deciding for themselves which ones uh, they can take, uh, which ones are useful and which ones aren't. The third reason why I think uh, early elections and party formation lead to a reduction in conflict after independence and more democratic success is that the party, the Congress, can solve a lot of conflicts within its party structure itself, rather than having to rely on emergency clauses or the use of draconian colonial uh, laws in order to try and deal with the conflicts that do emerge. And that's a really important thing. Congress is a broad federal party in this period in which although Nehru is at the top, there are plenty of people who are disagreeing with him, challenging uh, him, negotiating with him on important issues. Now, none of this emphasis on elections is meant to say that uh, this was a wonderful state of the world, that colonial elections were the best thing. It's just to say that uh, they're more valuable than people think uh, in trying to explain why India was able to do so much better than um, the many other colonies that didn't have as much experience with elections. Of course, Indians fought for these elections, right? They argued uh, intensely um, for the concessions that were made. They weren't just given uh, to the population. So the observant amongst you will have noticed that, well, if I'm saying that elections are really important, how can we possibly explain the differences that emerge between India and Pakistan? Because after all, India and Pakistan uh, were part of the same system. So how can this electoral argument uh, explain the variation between India and Pakistan that we see? So one thing that I think isn't generally remembered is that the Muslim League, uh, which won, as we see on the left here uh, in this uh, table, the Muslim League won a crushing victory in all the Muslim seats in 1946 elections. But what's not remembered as much is that in the 1936 to 37 elections, that were held, the Muslim League got crushed itself in all the areas that subsequently became Pakistan. They won no seats in the Northwest Frontier Province. They got 1% of the seats in Punjab. They didn't do well in Sindh. They didn't do well in Bengal. So all the areas that became part of Pakistan eventually were ones in which the Muslim League had very little institutional um, history. And in fact, as late as 1943 and 1944, the Muslim League had essentially no party organization in Punjab whatsoever. And they're writing saying, boy, we really have to create a party organization. So although the Muslim League cut deals with local parties in, um, in Punjab and Sindh and Bengal as partition approached, it really had no equivalent of the Congress party organization in any of these areas. What's the result of that? After 1947, the Muslim League senior officials, uh, senior party leaders go into these areas. They start telling the local people in Sindh or Bengal what to do, and tension immediately results. And when that tension results, what happens? The Pakistani leadership imposes emergency clauses, uh, the equivalent of uh, president's rule, governor general's rule, as it was called then, on every single region to try and resolve the conflicts, because it can't resolve them within the party itself in the way that the Indian governments do. All right, how, you know, can we think of a couple of examples of how an institutionalized party helps uh, do things, helps solve conflicts and solve problems in the period after 1947? So I think some of the most important steps that were made to resolve conflict in India in this period um, were to do with religious caste and linguistic cleavages. These were cleavages that people thought would rip the country apart. In 1950, what was done was a decision in the Constitution to take religion out as an organizing principle. This had been a key divide and rule principle of British rule. And in 1950, despite the fact 
that religion, or perhaps because of the fact that religion had been such a massive divide during the partition era, a decision is made that the state may not discriminate on uh, grounds of religion. Uh, they abolish religious reservations in employment, uh, and they also abolish religious reservations in party politics, a very important decision. The other two decisions, I think, um, that I'd point to in this period are the um, decision in 1952 to allow linguistic states after the movement in the South, and then that reworking of uh, linguistic states that you see from 1952 or 1953 up to 1966, and then the introduction of uh, caste reservations as a result of the move movement in uh, Madras in 1950 and 51, when the Congress party, after originally uh, not being in favor of caste reservations, decided to allow them. What the uh, linguistic states and caste reservations do is ensure that you're not going to have any macro cleavage between north and south, and it also ensures that within each of the states uh, you're going to have what political scientists call cross-cutting cleavages, lots of different kind of identities, so there's no permanent majority uh, and permanent minority. The, the large Hindu population is broken up into lots of different groups, and even within each state, you have lots of different groups. So there's potential for changing alliances with no permanent in-groups, no permanent out-groups. That's a very important way of resolving conflicts, and it's not what was done in Pakistan. Pakistan didn't take any of these important measures. Um, why is the party characteristic in Congress important in explaining this? Nehru didn't want to do either linguistic states or caste reservations. He's forced to do it because of the broad democratic structure of the Congress party in this period and strong opposition from uh, leaders in the South who tell him there's an election coming up in Madras in, uh, in 1952, and if you don't change your mind on caste reservations, we're really going to be hammered in the South. Right? So it's, it's a democratic party that's forcing the leadership to do things it doesn't want to do. That doesn't happen in Pakistan. When linguistic state movements come, uh, not linguistic states, when Bengali uh, language advocates protest uh, Jinnah in 1948 uh, and say we want to have Bengali as a, an official language in Pakistan because 56% of the population is Bengali speaking, Jinnah flies to Dhaka and then lectures people saying there can only be one official language in Pakistan, it's got to be Urdu. Uh, he's, he's tone deaf, he's centralized, he's authoritarian. It's a very different kind of party structure than the Congress party structure, where the leader, Nehru, all, with all his power uh, at the time, is forced to do things he doesn't want to do because of the democratic structure of the party. Um, just imagine for a moment if you hadn't had uh, states reorganization um, in India. Or, you, or God forbid, you had uh, states of the, the percentage sizes that exist in uh, Pakistan. So in Pakistan today, you have Punjab, which has an overwhelming majority of the population, 54%. You have Sindh with 21%, and then you have smaller states. What I've done here is just put those population percentages on a map of uh, India. What you can see immediately is how disastrous it would be if there was one large Hindu state that dominated the rest of the country, right? The move in India from nine to 29 states has really helped uh, you know, resolve, diffuse a lot of the conflicts that could have existed uh, had you not had states reorganization. And then the caste uh, reservations have also introduced cleavages within each state. Regardless what you may think of caste reservations in general, they paid, I think, an important uh, role in doing that. You also had early and very decisive action in India because you had a strong party to deal with civil-military relations. And I'll just give you a little bit of background on, the, um, on, on my work in that area. So remember that India had a very imbalanced uh, army during the colonial period. On the left, we've got the shares of each of the, um, each of the major provinces in 1921. And on the right, we've got the shares of the army. And as you can see, more than half of the entire army in 1929 was Punjabi and another 12% was uh, from Nepal, the Gurkhas, and then you had various other martial class um, uh, provinces that are highly represented. So there's a very unrepresentative army. Uh, Nehru and others were concerned that this would be an executioner of liberty after independence if there were no radical reforms that were made to the army. It was a conservative army. It was centralized under a commander-in-chief who sat in the cabinet 
They had their own military intelligence at this time that snooped on members of the general population um, uh, and actually paid off people in various, uh, various provinces um, that they felt were political risks. There were lots of ways in which the army uh, was perceived as something that could be a real problem for Indian democracy if it wasn't dealt with. And India's political party leaders, because they had a large structured party with its own planning and thinking about what the future was going to look like, had actually been thinking about how they were going to solve this for many years. So on the left is a white paper that they brought out from the Congress party in 1935 and the 50th anniversary of the Congress, uh, Congress's formation, basically laying out a plan for what they were going to do after independence to solve the problem of the army. This is very unusual by comparison with most other colonial states. You don't see this degree of thinking, not just about the army, but about the economy, about agriculture, about major areas. Um, and, and Patel is thinking about this too. Patel is a person who proposes uh, the NDA. He wants to diversify the stream of officers into the um, army so it's not just people from the traditional groups and you have multiple streams in so it's not just uh, captured by any one academy or institution and you're diversifying the streams of people into the army and therefore diversifying uh, the risk. Nehru uh, is appointed external affairs minister in September uh, 1946 and instead of uh, spending his first week on external affairs, he spends it uh, writing a long letter to the uh, head of the army in which he basically says, here's all the things that we need to change immediately. Uh, we need to Indianize the army. We need to change its composition. Uh, we need to establish that the civilian authority is superior to the military authority. And we need to recruit new police forces, like the CRPF today, um, that are going to keep the army out of domestic uh, law enforcement because we don't want the army to be dragged into politics. That's really bad. Uh, India actually does solve all these things in the period from 1947 to 55. They change the unified structure of the army in 1955 and create the structure that we have today with separate chiefs for uh, the Navy, the Air Force, and the army. They um, make sure that the, these young generals uh, who get pushed up in promotion as a result of um, the British officers leaving don't get to hang around for too long and, um, and give a problem for democracy. So they're pushed out. Kariapa, when he retires, is sent off to Australia and New Zealand as high commissioner. Uh, various other people are put off into side roles so they can't pose any potential threat uh, to government. They reduce the salaries and precedents. Nehru moves into Teen Murti in Delhi, which had been the commander in chief's house as a symbol of the fact that the civilians are now on top rather than the, uh, rather than the military. They do away with the domestic intelligence functions of military intelligence because they don't want military interference in uh, domestic politics. So in a variety of ways, India takes early and decisive action to deal with the problem of the military. One thing I'll say is that Pakistan does none of these things. Uh, Jinnah, Jinnah's idea is that once we create the state of Pakistan, that will in itself solve the problems. There are lots of uh, comments from people who were present at the time, senior army officers, that basically say Jinnah didn't understand the army. He never asked about the army. He doesn't really have a sense of this. Uh, it just wasn't a priority for him. But given the nature of the Congress and its long experience in government prior to independence, the Congress has been thinking about this for a long time, knows it has to take early action. If Jinnah had tried to fundamentally redo uh, the position of the Pakistan army with relation to the civil power, in 1947 or 1948, I think he could have made a lot of those same changes that were made in India. But Pakistan waited, and by waiting, it let the army entrench its position. And uh, Bhutto, in the early 1970s, when he tried to do the same reforms that the Indians had done in the 1950s, ran into a lot of trouble, and ultimately the army took him out in 1977. And no Pakistani uh, leader since then has tried to uh, bring about any kind of similar changes in the fundamental relationship between the army and the civilian government for obvious reasons. Nobody wants to uh, meet the same fate as Bhutto. So uh, let's see. I think uh, these were not free and fair elections in the way that we understand them today, but they were very, very important in explaining why India didn't become Pakistan and why India has done so differently than uh, many other former colonies. So I'll stop at that point and uh, let Professor Shasti um, uh, ask questions. <laughs>
Uh, I think there are several points which could be the starting point of the conversation. Uh, let me raise the first. You mentioned in passing about how uh, the Congress party had the advantage of a party structure mm -hmm. uh, prior to independence, which it was able to build up upon mm -hmm. after independence. Whereas the same benefit was not there in Pakistan vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim League. Now, can I stretch that argument a bit and say that Maybe it's also linked to the fact that all the leaders of the Muslim League who played a role in the creation of Pakistan mm -hmm. uh, did not live for too many years after the country's independence. Uh, within a few years, the crop of leaders in Pakistan who came to dominate the Muslim League had actually had a very little role to play as part of the mm -hmm. creation of the country. Whereas India's advantage was that for at least 17 years after independence, we had the stability of a leadership. Uh, and I'm, I'm not just talking of Jawaharlal Nehru, but the entire uh, yeah. range of leaders at that point of time who led the country, but had also been very important part of the freedom movement. Yeah. So would you say that's also an important distinction, not just the fact that the Muslim League did not have a leadership emerging yeah. from the multiple parts of what became Pakistan, but also the absence of the leadership beyond a particular stage of uh, time. Yeah, I, I would say that the character of the Muslim League as opposed to the character of the Congress Party is very important. Jinnah, um, nothing, nothing grew under the tree in Jinnah's party. Um, Jinnah was at the top. Um, Ayesha Jalal, a historian, has written a book called The Sole Spokesman because he really tried to marginalize every other important uh, Muslim provincial leader at the time. Um, you know, Surawardi and, and others, uh, by saying, I am the sole spokesman, and you need to do exactly what I tell you. And he had his lieutenant, Liaquat Ali Khan. Both of them died uh, early. Jinnah died in 48. Liaquat was assassinated shortly uh, afterwards. And the Muslim League was left in a very bad situation at that point. Because of its internal structure, after these couple of leaders had gone, there was really hardly anybody left. It's a, it's a complete failure party organization. Uh, it turns out that the party you needed to win independence, uh, and Jinnah welded that through his own force of will, did incredibly badly after independence. Sometimes in class, I, get, I ask my students uh, to do a little thought experiment and say, supposing um, that the Congress party had been headed after 1947 by somebody with Jinnah's personality rather than Nehru's personality. Um, how, would, how would things have turned out differently? And I think um, had there been somebody as uncompromising as Jinnah at the head of the Congress party, the various provincial leaders, this wide, broad bench of people who'd come up through the independence campaign, would have taken Nehru out, right? He would have faced a revolt that he couldn't have put down with one of his periodic threats to resign. Uh, because the party wouldn't have stood it, because it was fundamentally a much wider, broader party with a lot of strong provincial leaders, um, you know, Pan, others would have would have taken him out. So I very much agree with you. Yeah. With, with Let me comment. take the last point you made uh, forward. Uh, we are today in a world where uh, uh, a lot of people don't like to use the N word, the Nehru word. Uh, we are in a world where we are trying to. Uh, rewrite history and talk of history mm -hmm. in a different way. Uh, in that light, let me raise the next question, which you made a tangential reference to just now, with regard to Nehru's leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two schools of opinion which develop, which have developed on this, uh, largely contribution of historians and political mm -hmm. scientists. One, uh, expanding the, word, the view that you came up just now with, that Nehru was inherently democratic, that he was somebody who could have wielded all the powers, but the democratic streak in him did not allow that to happen. And therefore, uh, the Congress party did have uh, provincial level leaders who played an important role in their own provinces. Uh, while there is also the counter view, which I'd like you to take into account and link it to the larger issues you raised, that while Nehru was democratic in his approach, there was a limit to that democratic approach as long as his leadership was not challenged. 
all the provincial leaders you talk about, uh, they were allowed to have their own small fights. Mm -hmm. In Mysore, the question came whether it should be Nijlingappa or Hanumantaya. Both went to Nehru and Nehru said, look, I will not look after it. Both of you resolve it among yourself. Mm -hmm. Because Nehru did not want to play one against the other because either of them would accept his leadership at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So was Nehru's advantage that nobody challenged him, so therefore he could allow those small fights to happen lower. So uh, the critics would argue that that was not a democratic streak, but then the fact that his leadership was effect, uh, was uh, accepted did not uh, allowed him to uh, have at the lower level the interplay of uh, politics, which his daughter did not have a privilege of later, and therefore brought about the centralization of power that you see. Right. How would you respond to that comment? Um, I mean, Nehru, Nehru did feel himself challenged sometimes, for instance, by the socialists in the early 1950s. Um, one of the techniques he used to try and deal with these uh, challenges was to threaten to resign periodically, which is something we've seen in, in you know, amongst other prime ministers uh, over time. Periodically, you say, if you if you don't do what I want, I'll I'll do this. That's not happening. That's not happening in Karnataka today. But that's <laughs> <laughs> but that's but that's a very different response than the Jinnah response which would have been to say, I'm going to impose governor general's rule, or I'm going to impose president's rule, or I'm going to um, you know, smack you with an authoritarian response. It's, it's very different. The, the worst um, mistake that, that Nehru made, I think, uh, with regard to uh, dealing with party dissent was with uh, Krishna Menon um, and the whole question of India's defense, where Menon was very unpopular. Many, uh, he was unpopular personally, but also many Indians uh, at the time uh, thought, rightly as it turned out, that he was hurting the country's defense uh, you know, in the, in the run-up to, um, to the China war. And uh, Nehru tried to save Krishna Menon in 1962 after the China war by threatening to resign again. And that was a point when the various uh, state leaders said, uh, well, if you have to go over this, you will. Uh, and he backed down and, uh, and first moved Krishna Menon to a subsidiary position and then eventually fired him because he recognized that the strength of feeling in the Congress party and the country as a whole would no longer allow him to play this strategy that he'd done before. So that's probably the, the case where he was most authoritarian, I would say. Um, uh, my third uh, comment would be on a point you made uh, at the introduction of your presentation. Uh, when looking at India's democratic institutions and the initial mm. stability that was provided, uh, in retrospect, could we say today that the type of effort that should have been given to stabilize democratic institutions and institutionalize democratic processes in these institutions was something that was not done to the extent it should have been done. Uh, example, we did not see this distinction consciously made between party and government. Uh, if you read uh, Nehru's fortnightly letters to mm -hmm. chief ministers, which are correspondence between head of the central government and head of the state government, a lot of these correspondence talks about internal matters of the Congress party. Mm -hmm. saying that in the last week we were busy sorting out internal issues in the party, etc. Now, this, uh, and as you know, a lot of important government level decisions were taken at the meetings of the Congress Working Committee because a lot of chief ministers were also around. Now, this failure to make this distinction between party and government, to keep them separate, uh, was part of the aberrations that we have come to see in the functioning of democratic politics yeah. in subsequent years. And I'll end with the famous comment which uh, Raman Lohia made, that Nehru failed to make uh, four important distinctions. Distinction between country and the government, mm -hmm. that India is not Indian government. Distinction between government and party, that Indian government is not the Congress party and distinction between party and leader, that Indian government, Congress party is not the leader. 
because what Lohia warned to Nehru actually came true during Indira Gandhi's time when Devakanta Barua said, India is Indira and India is Indira. Mm. That distinction, which should have been made in the early years of uh, democracy, uh, not being made uh, uh, during days of one party dominant rule, it didn't really make a difference. But when we moved into a competitive party system, it became the start of the challenges of the polity. Yeah, I, th yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, so even in the late 1930s, during the first period of uh, Congress of devolved government in 1937 onwards, uh, already um, members of the Congress party and members of other parties are um, going to the police, they're going to civil servants, and they're saying, this is what you need to do. Um, don't uh, obey the law. Um, uh, do what we do, because we are the representatives. And, and it's, it's an issue uh, even then. And you can see in uh, the various uh, archives, like the UP archives, uh, Punt trying to uh, deal with this as an issue. And part of that is because the police is illegitimate. It's a, it's a form of colonial rule. And therefore, any action taken on the part of democracy to try and bend that to what seems to be the popular will is seen as being legitimate at the time. That it carries the real danger for the future, that you then say there's a difference between, uh, it, it's then much harder to say that there's an institution that's separate from the political will of the people. So people after independence, there are quotes from politicians uh, who say, uh, I am a representative of the people, the police are the servant of the people, and therefore the police have to do exactly what I want. And this kind of spirit comes in, um, it, it, no question. And it's, it is a problem, this, this party versus uh, institution divide. Uh, I have to say that parliamentary systems in general are more vulnerable, probably, to this than uh, systems with a clear division of government, because uh, you have fewer institutional protections. Um, in, in parliamentary systems against this. My final uh, point of conversation, uh, which is much more bringing uh, democracy from its historical mold to the more mm. current mold. Uh, we in Lokniti, as part of our uh, election studies, have been consistently making the point that the idea of democracy is extremely strong in India. If you ask people in India, mm -hmm. do you want India to be a democracy, 90% plus will say mm -hmm. yes. The idea of democracy is extremely strong, but many would argue the imagination of democracy is not as deep. The idea has taken firm roots, but the imagination, the depth that that understanding of democracy should be, at least among those who run the system, is not that deep. So do you think this, this dichotomy between the idea of democracy and its imagination is a byproduct of how in the initial years after freedom, the system came to be worked? So what, what do you mean by imagination? By imagination, I would mean, uh, see, uh, do you want the country to be a democracy? Yes. But then beyond that, what form does that democracy take? Are you talking of uh, people's participation? Are you talking of an election-only democracy? Mm -hmm. Are you talking of various avenues for that citizen to express herself in the democratic process? Mm -hmm. So uh, let me put it in a different way. There has been a spread of democracy in mm -hmm. terms of the idea. But has it taken deep roots in society, in parties, in those who run the political system in terms of how they think and how they feel and how they act? Yeah. The argument is that has not happened to the extent it should have. I think, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. So on, on one level, Indian democracy is really the, the CSDS and Lobniti uh, has shown has um, incredibly high levels of participation. So it's a general truism in the political science uh, world that uh, participation goes down the lower socioeconomic status uh, you are. Uh, 
and India is a massive exception to that. I mean, there's some debate over, over the numbers, but in general, the levels of participation amongst poorer people, much more. more marginalized people in India, is way higher than you see anywhere else. Uh, as you say, whenever there's been any poll done asking people how much they value democracy, uh, mm. very high. And levels of electoral participation are much higher than they are in the US, for instance. Um, so in, in terms of just many different indicators, things look pretty good. Uh, on the other hand, uh, now in terms of party system institutionalization indicators, what's striking is that although you have this incredibly high level of popular participation in democracy in India, many of the parties themselves are far from being internally democratic. Uh, they're not incredibly institutionalized. Some of them are very much uh, you know, dominated by uh, particular families or factions. Uh, and that, uh, that's a paradox, that you have this deinstitutionalization with a lot of dynastic uh, parties involved, at the same time as you have very high levels of popular participation and people seem to really value their, their rights. It's imperfect, but then I look at the UK where I was born and party politics there at the moment is a complete disaster. And then I'm, I'm resident in the US and you all know about uh, <laughs> the situation uh, there. So I don't think any of us uh, anywhere in the uh, democracies can feel very smug at the moment and point and say, well, that democracy isn't doing very well because God forbid, you know, um, the, the UK is a disaster. We've got Brexit with no plan coming up in, uh, in, in a couple of months. And Mr. Trump, well, less said the best. Maybe we should uh, open up the debate to the audience and get questions for you from the audience. This is based on this, uh, the notion that India has. It's working. Let it be a little louder, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Uh, that we have had a democracy. We our our democracy is a success because that's what the byline of what you're saying says. The answer is obviously yes and no because that's where it comes. Up. Whether you call it the idea of India or the idea of our democracy. I think the problem was in 47, when India became, this is a personal view, but I suppose others might share it. In 47, we had gone from being one of the richest countries in the world to one of the poorest countries in the world, per capita at least. I think with all Nehru's other faults, one of the problems that he had, and, and he brought us out of the rut in many ways, mm. uh, the problem that he had was that we didn't have money either to feed our people or to teach them values or schools were just impossible to provide or to do industrialization of the country. He chose a process which was not socially, with, with the social sciences I think suffered at that time. Mm -hmm. the whereas our democracy, in any case, democracy was a Western concept. India wasn't a democratic country with 500 kingdoms mm -hmm. till then. And it's a French notion, it's not even a British or an American notion where there were wars going on all the time. So given that scenario, I think we could not have, and unfortunately, we, we could not have got into a demo democratic mode with, with, uh, with clarity of what the democracy should be, what democracy is and what it should be. We loved the concept in the, in the constitution that was laid down by those leaders who knew what democracy was, who at least had an idea of what democracy was. The average person did not. Uh -huh. He loved going to uh, vote, but he didn't know what was happening. Would you like to respond to that? Um, I mean, there was a debate over whether there should be a mass franchise, um, with some people saying, let's not take the risk. There are many people who don't understand um, democracy, who aren't ready for democracy. Um, let's restrict the franchise. Yeah, it was a 14 percent, roughly, of the population franchise in 1947. And as uh, Ornit Shani uh, has has written a nice book uh, recently, looking at the way in which uh, the election commission went off and tried to enroll Indians in an experiment that many people thought was a dangerous experiment and might lead to problems. And I think looking back, though, people would say this has been a tremendous success. Uh, that India took the risk of mass enfranchisement 
And uh, the, the poorer segments of the population, the less literate ones, value democracy just as much as the other people. And what's ingrained now, whatever we may think the problems are with Indian democracy, one thing that's clear is that all segments value alternation of election, you know, regular elections, alternation in power, their right to vote. That, that is deeply, deeply ingrained in the population. And you saw this in the emergency in the 1970s. You've seen it at various other times. I think the, 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 other, the larger point is that when Rajendra Prasad discussed the provision on giving everybody the right to vote, he called it an article of faith. And I think that was a faith which was well posed in the people of India. And as you made a reference in passing, it's actually the less educated, less privileged, poorer groups of society which are actually more active in the democratic process. Uh, India has that rare case of voting above national average being much more in the less economically socially privileged and the rural parts of the country than the other side. So in a sense, yeah. that point you make about the strength of Indian democracy being its level of participation, mm -hmm. I think is a critical factor. Uh, yeah, to yes. what extent? Yes. Yeah, hi. To, to what? Oh, yeah. Yeah, after you, it comes there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for the riveting presentation. I have two questions. First, concerning the Belgian Congo example. Uh, is it possible because Belgium was one of these European powers which was in denial of its colonial status. They didn't have the institutions like you have in Paris, the school of, uh, it's a very long French name, Oriental Studies, which trained the civil servants for the colonies or in Britain, the ICS. And uh, I've lived in Belgium and it's very interesting, both in Belgium and Netherlands, they talk about the occupation of the Germans uh, more than their colonial past as you would hear in France or Britain. Would that be a reason why they never had the structures of the design. Secondly, uh, as for the Indian elections are concerned, how much of credit are you willing to give to the civil servants? Because uh, there was a neutral civil service, and there still is, which conducts these elections. And even in this election in 2019, we had the example in West Bengal where the chief election commissioner uh, preponed the votes against the wishes of the political leaders, the political elite. So. The election commissioners are drawn, drawn from the IAS, both at the state and central level, and they have been acting relatively independently, I'm told, in the national and the state uh, elections. The panchayat, the gram, the civil elections are a bit okay. different. So would you concede there is a lot of credit to be given to the civil service? Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think you know, Patel played a major, major role in the decision to, um, to keep the ICS. Uh, and keep the civil service structure rather than do away with it, as other people had said. You know, let's let's uh, let's change that structure. It is important, but I don't think it's necessarily a complete explanation for the democratic success, or a very important one. And the reason is that uh, a big chunk of the ICS officers also go to Pakistan, and uh, so we can't explain um, democratic failure in Pakistan with the same thing that we've used to explain a, a form of success in India. I think these party issues and the military issues are important. There's also a fiscal element to this as well, I think. So one problem that, Dr. Ambedkar wrote a very good book in 1941 called uh, Thoughts on Pakistan. And he said, you know, partition might not actually be so bad for India because we'll get rid of the, north, um, the Northwest frontier which is very dangerous, very expensive to defend, creates all these security problems for us. And we'll also get rid of a big chunk of our imbalanced army because all these people from West Punjab and Northwest Frontier Province are going to go. And that will actually improve the level of imbalance in the Indian army. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. And the other thing he pointed out was that uh, once you get rid of the Northwest Frontier uh, Province uh, and, and Pakistan, that India will no longer have to pay for it. And India inherited most of uh, the revenue producing areas, and Pakistan inherited most of the costs, uh, and also a lot of the soldiers from Punjab. So Pakistan was much more hobbled than India at the point of independence, because 70% of its expenses were going to this army it couldn't afford. And if you think about it, that's sort of the problem that Pakistan has now. You can't spend as much on development. You can't spend as much to educate your population because you're carrying this enormous strategic cost with two borders up in Afghanistan 
and then against uh, India. And that's hobbled Pakistan for a very, very long time. Uh, let's see, the Belgian-Congo question. Belgium doesn't have a history of uh, it denied itself being called a colonial power. Um, you know, Belgium was a colonial uh, power. It was probably the worst of all the colonial powers. The terrible things were done in the Belgian Congo. Um, when King Leopold uh, was finally forced to give up uh, the Congo as his personal possession in the early 1900s, uh, he, uh, he's reported to have said, they may get my Congo, but they're never going to know what happened here. And the radiators in the royal palace were too hot to touch for a week because they were burning all the records of all the atrocities that were actually conducted in uh, the, the Congo at that time. The Belgian idea after that was we are going to keep the population educated enough to do our bidding and largely uh, ignorant otherwise. We'll never let them get to a higher level. And there were no electoral institutions created until 1957 of any kind in the Belgian Congo. So given that there was no pressure, uh, you could say the same about Algeria or Kenya or some other regions to try and change some of these deep structural inequalities. And the Indians were able to shape things a lot more because they had this longer period of government before independence. Yeah, how, um, uh, how and to what extent do you think the uh, Indian constitution and judiciary com contributed to India's democratic success? Um, Tremendously, really. I mean, a, a, an independent judiciary is absolutely key. Um, the Indian Constitution is the is the longest constitution, I think, in the world. Um, it's it's stood the test of time really pretty well. Chunks of it are adapted from the 1935 Government of India Act. What were the key decisions? Uh, main, maintaining a, a a federal system with uh, strong unitary um, aspects was very important. Uh, the division of resources between uh, the uh, state and the center, very important. Having a large national uh, civil service that helps link the state governments to the, uh, to the central governments, those are all key decisions that were made. Um, there were then adaptations made along the way. As I said, the First Amendment to the Constitution um, dealt with some of these caste issues uh, that we talked about, reservations, inequality. Um, it, it also, unlike most constitutions, says here's where we think we're going in terms of our um, goals. Uh, most constitutions don't have any of that. They just have here are the rules rather than here are the aspirations. And the Indian constitution is important, I think, because it also gives you uh, aspirations. I don't know, what sure. would you say? Sure. You're, you're... I, I, I would uh, fully concede your point that the advantage we had also uh, was a constitution which, as you rightly said, had a large element of the Act of 1935. But they did bring in a strong flavor of what they thought was the requirement of that time. And I think the, the way the preamble spells it out, uh, and that's the reason uh, scholars have really looked at it as a document of social justice in yeah. that sense, uh, given the type of... Uh, uh, framework it set out for uh, the leaders of independent India. Yes, uh, you have been wanting to ask a question for the long, for long. Yeah. Can you give the mic here, please, in the center? Um, can I ask a question? Maybe. No, wait a minute. He has been wa waiting for long. I would like to ask, sure. give him a chance. It's right in the front. Right. Um, one of the comments you had was that the Congress was very successful in accommodating. Um, minor cleavages, which were on the regional linguistic and caste lines. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, to, to, um, would you imagine that, uh, suppose it had been the BJP in power in 1947, given that they're constructing an identity of political Hinduism, which goes above mm -hmm. regional and caste lines, um, do you think they would have been less successful democratically in uh, ending up with a multicultural society that we ended up in at that time? Yeah, so the, the, the sort of, uh, right, so the BJP didn't exist at the time, but, but, um, but the Muslim League in Pakistan tried to deal with the great diversity that it faced in Pakistan in 1947. Uh, through a policy of saying, here's one large Muslim identity, Pakistani identity, 
that we're going to uh, create that's going to unify us, given our various, um, uh, our various fissures. And we're not going to have states reorganization or provincial reorganization in Pakistan because we see that as divisive. And we've just come out of this bloody partition and we don't want anything that smacks of that. Uh, and you'd have to say in, in that particular period, that was not something that worked. It didn't have the desired results in, in Pakistan. Uh, the Bengalis, the Sindhis, the Baluchis, every single, you know, the, the uh, Pashtuns, every single unit uh, starts to protest and then emergency clauses are used to try and do this because um, it, it, was a, it was a solution in Pakistan that uh, didn't accord with the underlying diversity of, uh, of the country. There were people in India at that time uh, who also said, let's not have uh, linguistic states, let's have larger national uh, unifying uh, concepts in this, in this period, uh, let's not acknowledge uh, caste diversity, uh, religious diversity, uh, and um, you know, a different vision uh, won out. And for that period, it was a more successful vision than the, uh, the solutions that were tried uh, by Jinnah in Pakistan. Um, good evening, sir. my name is Anubha, uh, here. Okay. Um, uh, okay, fine. So uh, my question to you is, uh, is it justified to look at the success of Indian democracy as a comprehensive whole uh, and the continuation of the same, for example, uh, in context of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, would you, uh, what would you pin down the problem there in terms of why democracy, democracy uh, is facing problems in permeating that state? Is it merely because of asymmetric federalism or, or their reason uh, beyond that, that you could be able to identify. Thank you. So I'm not an expert on uh, Jammu and Kashmir. I mean, it, it, it's it's clear that people point to you know they point to Punjab, they point to Jammu and Kashmir, they point to nor the northeast as various times as saying these are you know significant problems with uh, Indian democracy. Um, those are very important regions, they're also relatively uh, small shares of the Indian population, right? Um, that 90%, 95% plus of the Indian population in the core of subcontinental uh, India hasn't had the same kind of issues that you get in, in, uh, in, in these other regions. That's not to say that there aren't problems. There are many Indian uh, activists, lawyers, others, who are pointing to those uh, particular problems. Um, I mean, the, the, the Kashmir issue is, is very complex. It goes back to the, you know, the, the situation in which uh, Kashmir first acceded uh, to India, and then the question of whether they're, you know, plebiscites, what consent, what accession, there are various debates over that. Uh, I don't follow it closely enough on a, you know, piece by piece uh, thing to really give you an answer that's a sort of in-depth uh, let's let's look at exactly why uh, Kashmir hasn't been fully incorporated. Uh, I just wanted to have your view when you compared India with other colonies. Uh, would you say that uh, a large educated middle class made some difference if you compare it with other colonies. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it it did. So, um, transitioning from a colonial state uh, to an independent state requires human capital. It requires people. It requires uh, enterprise. It requires knowledge, literacy, and India. Um, although the the literacy level is not as high as it could be at independence, around fifteen percent, I think. Um, it was much higher than many, uh, certainly higher than the Belgian Congo, higher than Kenya, high, higher than lots of other regions. You also had a trained and educated population that was capable of filling every single job that the colonial power had left. That's not the case in many uh, former colonies where there were real adjustment issues at the point of decolonization because the human capital in order to fill all these positions didn't exist. India had more than enough people in order to fill uh, all these roles, and that's a very important explanation, I think, 
in explaining why uh, the transition was easier in India than it was in many other colonies in, in Africa and Asia. Um, in West Africa, um, you know, the colonial state was more like the Indian uh, example than in East Africa. So in East Africa, you had very high levels of ethnic segregation in a place like Kenya, um, where a lot of the top jobs were reserved for whites or were reserved for uh, Asians and Africans were really kept out of those positions. In West Africa, uh, by and large, in the British colonies, Africans were included at a much higher level in places like uh, the Gold Coast that became Ghana. And West Africa has had a generally better um, experience of the British colonies, not in the French colonies. If you were to go into a government office in uh, the French colonies in the 1950s, the typist would be European, right? Which would be inconceivable in, uh, in the Indian colonial state that you would have people doing middle level bureaucratic positions. And the French colonies had a much harder transition uh, to independence because they had fewer trained people ready to take over uh, than, than in the Indian case. Yeah. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, we can't make out where the question is coming yeah. from. Yes. So, okay. uh, for West Punjab till 46, the Unionist Party was running a pretty feudal uh, political structure, yeah. and they kind of crumbled away after the Second World War. Did that legacy also seep into the uh, way the political state developed in Pakistan? Um, yeah, so the Unionist Party, as you rightly say, had a lot of feudal involvement. The Unionist Party um, you know, was, was unlucky in that some of its uh, senior leaders uh, died. And then the Muslim League mobilized against it to push the government uh, down um, you know, and, then, and then took over. So, so the Muslim League never created in West Punjab a party structure that fundamentally challenged the feudals. They, the Muslim League went in and cut deals with the existing feudal population uh, in Pakistan uh, in 47 rather than challenge them. It hastily cobbled together coalitions. Uh, the Muslim League also didn't push forward land reform, right? So imagine, um, I, I mean, despite the problems in the north of, uh, in, in, in some parts of North India today, there was significant land reform in, uh, in the 1950s. That didn't happen. In, uh, in, in Pakistan. You still had the feudals in Sindh, you still had the feudals in Punjab. Uh, there was never a party structure that was capable of forming a counterweight to either the feudals or the army and leading to significant changes in those. And the Congress at that time in the, in the 50s was capable of doing these major things in India. Yes, it's still a problem. Pakistan still needs major land reform. Uh, I have a, sorry, here. Up, up here, up here, to the, to the left, here, here, here. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I have a very quick question. Um, so not all of, uh, so you made the great point, and I think that's an interesting point about elections having a long history in India. Yeah. But that was true only for the British-ruled parts of India. Yeah. Now, there were princely states, and the bulk of the princely states were, in fact, in India as opposed to Pakistan. And I suppose approximately one-fourth to one-third of India's population lived there with almost little or no experience of elections. Yeah. Uh, how did, I mean, there were Congress units, of course, in those states, but how do we then explain how democracy took root in some of these princely states uh, post-elections? Like, how did then, they, how did the integration process happen into the party structure such that, you know, democracy became more stable in India? I mean, it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, I mean, Congress did go in and set up its own cells after uh, independence in each of these states. It was the complex states reorganization process where they were absorbed into the larger structures. But still, I, I, what, what you make me think of is I wonder if we were to look today at the princely state areas within the individual states and look at democratic indicators, whether you would see substantial differences. And I think probably, I, you know, I haven't done this, but I think probably you would see some differences. So one thing that we know is that some states were much better governed than others amongst the princely states. So you've got a Travancore and Cochin or a Mysore were better than um, you know, some states in Rajputana, for instance, right, in the, in the colonial period. And my, my guess would be that the Travancore and Cochin um, story uh, is gonna be a lot happier, or the Mysore story is gonna be a lot happier 
than those other states, in part because of the character of the princely states' pre-independence. So there were assemblies in some of the southern states. There were significant investments in places like, uh, like Mysore or uh, Travancore and Cochin in the education of lower castes and the education of women and development that look very, very different than those in other princely states. And probably those, those are going to be correlated with changes in, in public goods, development, democratic participation today. So your question is a very good one. I don't have the perfect answer, mm -hmm. but what it, wants, what it makes me want to do is go out of here and start looking at the district level data to see whether I can come up with a better I, uh, answer to your, your I, very good question. If I could make a yeah. point on that. I think if you look at the princely states and their integration into India, you would see there are three categories there. Mm -hmm. First, the princely states which did have the democratic structures which were similar to the structures mm -hmm. in British India, and you have already made reference to that, and that integration was much easier. Secondly, you had certain princely states where you did not have the democratic experience, but then you had a strong presence, as you said, of the Indian National Congress in those regions, mm -hmm. which were already there fighting against in some ways, the monarchy or the, the kings in those uh, princely states. Thirdly, you have those which neither had a strong presence of the Congress nor had a representative institution. And if you look at some of those, the process of integration into democratic India, the type of uh, party leaders that emerged there, the classes which, from which those leaders emerged, you will see there is that clear pattern of the more affluent, the more elite emerging in the leadership positions in the beginning there. And those states having a much longer period of transition mm -hmm. to truly democratic rule. Are you thinking of somewhere like Hyderabad? Then? Yes, yeah. sta states like that. Yeah. And also what the, the Rajasthan that you referred to. Yeah. You have a much slower process of, uh, of uh, the uh, different social groups getting into the process of governance. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, um, very well. I have two questions on the small ones. Uh, in Rajasthan, uh, you mentioned Sonia asked the Union states in the four different states. Uh, I have to help. Uh, can you? Yeah, it's working. Uh, four distinctions, but I heard three. Maybe I'm mistaken. Um, uh, and the fourth one I'd like to know. And the other is a very, very large question. And that is the political uh, form of democracy is under attack everywhere in the world. We are tilting towards fascism in some, in some places. Do you think human nature intrinsically is combative, selfish, greedy, and does not appreciate democracy? The second question is for <laughs> you. I'll Thanks. quickly answer the easier question and then leave the rest time to you. Uh, I was talking of four distinctions across three levels. Country, party, government, leader. So the four, but then when you talk of four distinctions, it's at three levels. So therefore it looked three levels, but it was four distinctions. Hmm. Um. I mean, if you ask people, they say that they value democracy and that they want democracy. And yet all of us seem to be very dissatisfied with our political leadership and the way that democracy actually functions wherever we live in the world. Um, uh, is that because, so why is that? Um, w one thing is we, we want, uh, we want everything. We want high services, low taxes. We want a lot of incompatible things. And politicians respond to that. And often we don't like what they come up with. Um, so is the imperfection with democracy or is the imperfection with our incompatible desires and politicians responding to those? It's a hard, it's a hard question to ask. Uh, I don't know what you would think. We have tried to answer that in our Lokniti studies in another way. Uh, in India, at least, is it the emergence of the critical citizen? Mm -hmm. The citizen who is not willing to take anything that the state offers and says that we are moving towards uh, fulfilling people's aspirations. The citizen wants to interrogate its leadership, wants to question its parties. And over time, having lived and worked democracy, this desire to inter interrogate your leadership is today much stronger. That's our argument. 
But then the larger question, and I would also uh, crave his indulgence on that, uh, is it because we are increasingly seeing a polarized world and a world where the differences between people are becoming much more skewed. Mm. And this difference is becoming skewed is part of the reason why this whole concept of we and they is coming up and to a certain extent explains the, the rise of the right across the world. Uh, in fact, uh, when the US elections happened, a lot of us in the beginning said that Trump is going to divide American society. But as he got closer to winning, most of us said he's not going to divide American society, but represents a divided American society. So in a sense, I think this, this, this hiatus is caused by that existing gulf in society. So in a sense, politics mirrors the reality that you find in society. That would be my immediate response to the point you made. I, I, mean, I, I mean, there are high degrees of polarization in many societies at the moment, much higher than they were in the 60s or the 70s. So if you, um, and, and if we take a United States example, um, if you look at the ideological um, um, uh, composition of the United States Congress in the late 1960s, early 1970s, there are ways that you can categorize people on ideology from left to right. And if you look at that in deciles, in the, um, in the 1960s and the early 1970s, you get Democrats and Republicans in most of the deciles, right? It's only at the very extremes that they go to one or the other. Now, some of that's for bad reasons. You know, you have a very racist Democratic Party and you have, you know, more Republican moderates. Uh, you know, that's a bad reason. But if you look at those charts today in the US, the only place there's any overlap between Democrats and Republicans is the middle bit. And every other one, the Democrats sort on one side and the Republicans sort on the other. And that creates massive problems in government uh, because uh, people don't agree on anything and they regard the other people on the other side as, uh, as enemies. Uh, and, and you see this in, in a variety of different uh, countries across the world. What's leading into that? Well, um, you know, social media, internal homogeneity in uh, parties, in which people who don't agree with the leadership of the party on every single issue uh, are pushed out uh, in, in the US, that's very, very common. So you get an ideological sorting which creates much less potential for actually uh, you know, uh, compromising with people who are ideologically different than you to try and come up with better solutions for policy. And that's certainly a problem in the country I live in. Uh, it's also a problem in the UK. The enemy language uh, comes up a lot. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about this. You have to be a little louder, please. I want to ask a question about the civil-military relations. Uh, oh. Given that in the more recent times, uh, the actions of the military is being used to get a stronger political foothold, uh, how would you see civil-military relations today? And how do you think civil-military relations, given that military is getting more politicized, will, s will play out in the next five years? Can you get the mic going back there? Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think the Indian Army itself is resistant to being drawn into politics. Uh, after the uh, emergency in 1977, at least according to one of uh, the general's memoirs, uh, Sanjay uh, Gandhi and Mrs. Gandhi uh, contemplated uh, drawing the military in to try and disregard the result of the 1977 uh, elections and General Reiner, who was in charge at that time, uh, said that he wasn't having anything uh, to do with it. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi also uh, rode to electoral power on the back of the 1971 uh, war, and the military tried to keep out of things at that time. I think the Indian military uh, really takes very seriously its role as a multi community military that's involved in the defense of the country and in which internal fissures shouldn't play a major part. It doesn't want to be drawn into that. And politicians may try in various ways to capitalize on what the military does, but that doesn't mean that the military itself wants to be drawn into this. And I think the Indian military has been very successful in the period uh, after independence in generally uh, avoiding being drawn in. And one important part of that is uh, the growth in uh, paramilitary forces in, from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s onwards, uh, 
as well as the development of Rashtriya rifles uh, units more recently, those are means basically of keeping the military out of domestic politics. That if you have important law and order things that need to be done in a state, uh, that you call on those paramilitary forces uh, first, or if you're dealing with the Northeast or Jammu and Kashmir, maybe you deal with the Rashtriya rifles, and you keep the regular military out of involvement. It's a very different situation from uh, Pakistan, where at various times the military has been used to collect electricity bills in Karachi. Um, because no other institution can be trusted uh, to, to, to do that. Um, so I, I, I think it's a somewhat happier story. That's not to say that, that uh, politicians won't use uh, you know, various things that are out there to try and get uh, their own advantage. But, but the history has been uh, pretty good on this issue, I think. Uh, we'll have the last two questions together and then close the discussion. Okay, yeah, our friend here, yes. And after that, we'll move here. Uh, <clears throat> would you say that the democratic process uh, that we have successfully displayed has some uh, background with the Indic civilization ethos that we inherited? Uh, and our kingdoms, the 126 or whatever number before independence, were not mirror images of the European Western type of uh, kingdoms. Here, there, there used to be a system where a man in an emergency, I mean, we were all at least there in the mind. You could go and ring a bell and the king came and he said, uh, I mean, there was a slight bit of a democratic, it's called Raj Dharma, and certain concepts were there in the mind. So would you say that the influence of that brought about the success that we see now? Okay, could we have one more question and take it together? Mm -hmm. Yes, question from this side. Um, so I'm studying transportation governance and one of the things I keep on running into is that the power seems to be centralized federally and then state in the state and then cities and, and small wards don't have any power in the participatory governance and then if there is participatory governance, it it's kind of just administrative and, and doesn't play into the decision making. So I guess my question is, is uh, how right am I in that assumption and, and what I've been reading? And also, what role did colonialism have in that, in developing that? Yeah. Um, yes. So after 1919, when the local self-government starts in a, in a very serious way with actual some fiscal powers and real areas of responsibility, there are continual complaints in the 1920s and 30s that sort of echo what you're saying, that, uh, the, the, that the governments are corrupt, that they're not being given enough power, that the uh, provinces are actually um, um, canceling the governments for periods of time uh, and not holding regular elections. And, if we, and, and so some of the, the weakness of the municipal levels of government and the lower levels of government are very visible even during the colonial period. They don't have enough money. The provinces are uh, overruling them at higher levels. MLAs, or the equivalent of MLAs at that time, are, um, are, are dominating these local governments. And it's not a vibrant uh, phase. Now, the Panchayati Raj um, clauses were supposed to try and fix that. But still, the issue of whether they have sufficient amounts of money on autonomy from the other parts of the government that they need in order to actually carry out the functions that they're supposed to be doing, that's, that's still an issue. Um, so it's, it's not exactly the same now as it was in the 20s or 30s, but I don't think you can look back um, to any period and say that local government was really a success in this. And, and it wasn't a success in the colonial period, and it's, it's got a lot of problems like those you're talking with um, today. Indic civilization. Yeah, so I, um, so it's, it's clear that the, the colon, you know, I, I wasn't making the argument that the colonial state is everything in trying to explain um, what happens after independence. It's clear that wherever you are in the world, um, what happens after independence is a product of the relationship between the colonial state and the local people, and the local people and traditions are going to interact with the colonial state to try uh, you know, in explaining the outcome. In Botswana, for instance, people try and relate uh, the success of democracy to traditional uh, African gatherings called the Kogotla, and they say this is a pre-democratic tradition that we can basically trace through, and this is part of the explanation for Botswana uh, success today. 
as a democracy. And you know, I'm sure you can look at uh, Indian elements of, of, of sedition. Um, you know, whether you can get good measures and do this in a sort of social scientific way uh, to actually prove and trace through these links seems like it's pretty hard to me, which is not to say that there's not some element of uh, you know, cultural patterns, traditional state patterns that, that, that follow through. It's just to say that they can't be easily measured. Uh, is there, uh, Ravi, is there time for one more question or do we need to close? Okay, uh, very simple question. I apologize if you already touched on it because I reached here a tad late and I might have missed uh -huh. a little bit. The question is very simply, according to you, what are the top three risks our democracy faces? And the second part of the question is, how do we de-risk ourselves against that using any method possible? For example, uh, new media or artificial intelligence or anything you can think of. So that's the question. Huh. So let's see. So um, I mean, one thing I'm worried about, uh, and this is a national security kind of issue, is that in the technological world we live in now, it's pretty easy for uh, one country to launch a cyber attack on another country and put the fingerprints of uh, somebody else on that attack. Um, so, you know, Estonia a few years ago was subject to a complete denial of service. Uh, under some international law, you might say that this is an act of war. Imagine if uh, you're in a situation where a country that's uh, perceived as an international rival of your country has fingerprints put over uh, an electronic attack. How do you how do you respond to that? Uh, that, that seems a real problem to me. Um, polarization, social media, WhatsApp, uh, rumors being spread uh, very quickly is an issue all over the world. Can we uh, respond? Can we ascertain whether it's um, reliable? It probably swung the US election with 70,000, 80,000 votes or so. Um, seems to be in a product of uh, intense polarization and misinformation. And that's a problem for democracy in general. And then let's see what, uh, the third thing I think is natural resources uh, and, and changes in climate and the weather. So uh, India is gonna have to grapple with severe water shortages probably. We're already grappling in India with massive uh, pollution issues. And is a government, um, you know, how can we coordinate a government response to that? Especially in an environment where everybody says it's another layer of government's problem. Uh, coming up with national solutions to that is a problem in the United States, where I live. It's a problem everywhere. Uh, but, it, you know, India's, India's hitting lots of resource limits and pollution limits in different areas. And I think that's probably the third area I would point to. I don't know what you would say, Andy. Friends, I think we have had a very, very uh, interesting conversation with Professor Wilkinson. And uh, I'd like to thank him for having spared this evening for us and having responded to all our questions and having answered such a range of issues. Uh, I wonder whether there is a formal, yeah, uh, is there a formal vote of thanks from the yeah. side of the... Yeah. So uh, BIC would thank all of you for coming to our event today. We'd love to thank um, Professor Steve Wilkinson for being here today and Dr. Sandeep Shastri for sharing your views on these issues. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Sandeep. Let's switch this off.